Robert Evans here, and we'll get to the Vince McMahon episodes in a second. I wanted to let you all know that for the fourth year in a row, we are doing our fundraiser for the Portland Diaper Bank. Uh, Behind the Bastards supporters have been helping to fund the Portland Diaper Bank since 2020 and bought millions of diapers for people who really need them. So if you go to GoFundMe and type in BTB Fundraiser for PDX Diaper Bank, or just type in BTB Fundraiser Diaper Bank GoFundMe into Google, anything like that, uh, you will find it. So please, uh, GoFundMe, BTB fundraiser for Portland Diaper Bank help us raise the money that these people need to get diapers to folks who need them desperately. Oh boy, it's another episode of us talking about Vince fucking McMahon and also wrestling history because they're kind of inextricable. And you know who else is inextricable? My guests on this episode, Tom Ryman and Sean Riley, aka Sean Baby. How are you both doing today? Oh, I'm so ready for some Vince. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is so true. I cannot be extracted. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. I you both had blood tests recently. I'm, that I'm like showed, a blood infection. Yeah, you are you are <laughs> deficient in vitamin V. Um, oh, for Vince, McMahon. fill me with that, Vince. Yeah. Anyway, here we go. So as Vince Jr. remade wrestling in his own image, he knew that he was going to remake the popular image of wrestlers. His dad's most recent big star, the man who had sold out matches and ignited imaginations throughout the 70s, was one of the all-time coolest people to ever live on this planet, Andre the fucking giant. And uh, I thought you were going to say <laughs> Brutus the Barber Beefcake. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> fucking Andre, man. We we are I'm we so excited. Andre. I am yeah, so excited Andre's to great. talk about Andre the Giant. <laughs> I hope there's lots of poop stories, boss. <laughs> We'll tell we want a peanut. <laughs> we'll have one or two. So, <laughs> born Andre Rene Rusimov in 1946, Andre had gigantism caused by too many growth hormones. Which kind of, as a young kid, you know, he's he, he's a normal size, but like once he kind of hits, you know, gets into his late teens, I think um, he starts to grow and just never stops. Like he's growing until the day he dies. It's part of why he dies, right? Because his His organs can't really keep up with how big he is. Um, He winds up kind of at his height being about seven foot four. Um, Normally, I think most of his wrestling career is about 450 pounds. Kind of by the end, he's like 520. Um, He's he's a very large man. (laughs) He is he is a massive dude. I think Um, they listed him at 700 on some announcements. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it, look, it's credible. If you saw yeah. Andre the Giant and someone said that man weighs 700 pounds, you go, yeah, man, I don't know, sure. <laughs> yeah, they always, they always increase those numbers, yeah. but yeah. But but he is massive. Um, sure, yeah, you, yeah. you, you, you would yeah. believe, I yeah. believed that he was 700 pounds. <laughs> sure, yes, sure, it scans. Um, now, Andre is a very bright guy guy he's a really smart kid he's very good at math it's interesting he's he's when he's in kind of primary school he does really well in math um and some of the like adults around him are kind of surprised when he doesn't continue his education at 14 but he's like i'm not supposed to be a smart person i'm just gonna like work on a farm you know um it was kind of noted by people around him at the time that he very easily did the work of four men and one thing you have to know When you look at Andre, his most famous kind of cultural touchstone is obviously the movie Princess Bride. Um, That is near the end of his life. He is not in great health in that movie. Um, Kind of very famously in that scene when Princess Buttercup like leaps into his arms, they actually had to have her like on uh, uh, strings or something so that the weight was not put on his back because he was in he was in such bad shape. You know, he Mm -hmm. was he was he was sick at that point in his life at the height. Like when he is a young man and is, you know, 18, you know, early 20s and stuff. Andre is jacked and not just a huge man, like he's a big guy, you know, in the, the Andre most people know. If you watch videos of young Andre, he is both swole and seven foot four. Um. Some of the shit, some people will write that like he was not a great technical wrestler. He was just good at kind of presenting himself and he was entertaining. Um, I don't think that's fair. I've watched videos of him wrestling as a young man and he can do shit. He's picking up like 250 pound dudes and throwing them one handed across the fucking (laughs) ring. He is leaping and landing onto people with his entire body weight and not killing them. That's a, see, that's a technical skill, right? That's a, that's a Tekken boss. <laughs> yeah. Um, he is, and watch- he's mesmerizing like young Andre. Yeah, absolutely. Just like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
amazing. Anyone like, saying he wasn't a good wrestler is uh, no, fucking no, wrong. He, he was they fucking only, incredible. They, yeah. They only saw 80s Andre. Yeah. If, if you say that. Even and then, it, uh, he was pretty messed up. There, there's he some pretty great, yeah, early yeah. 80s. He's got some, but it's, it's also, you know, it's one of those things. As a kid, I guess I knew that his like nickname was the eighth wonder of the world. Watching young Andre wrestle dudes. Like it is awe inspiring. It's like mm-hmm. watching a fucking hurricane. <laughs> like it yeah. is like I, I don't think it's an exaggeration. He's amazing. Um, big Andre the Giant fans. It sounds like all around the table. Today. All around. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. great. Uh-huh. So um, it is true, obviously, you know, as he gets older, especially his mobility issues mean that he can't handles and he's never really he's never able to do like the leaping off the turnbuckle stuff kind of because he's. He is, you know, too big for some things. He is very skilled. Anyway, um, Andre is such a big hit for his dad that Vince Jr. is like, I want this guy, but more so. So the first thing he does is he keeps Andre the Giant traveling more than ever in the early 1980s. Um, I don't think there's a man in America who puts together the air miles this man does. He said about Andre in 1983. He's traveling every day. Two weeks ago, he was in Japan. He's everywhere. Lucky for us, his IQ is as large as his body. He travels most of the time on his own, does everything for himself. There are guys who have to have someone with them all the time. I don't think any general manager in a sport says he has a larger, can say he has a larger collection of eccentrics than we do. But not Andre. He'll always be there when you need him. And this He's is a real genius. He can book his own plane tickets. <laughs> it is like. One of the like, obviously, Andre did love, I think, love the job, love doing it. Um, These flights are nightmares for him. Yeah. Uh, One of the things I guess he can't. Yeah. He literally couldn't fit in the airplane bathrooms. They had to like, like put a curtain aside and let him like go into a bucket when he was on long haul flights. Because there was like, you can't fit Andre the Giant. They would fly low enough so that they could open a window without depressurizing the plane. (laughs) He's just Um, hanging out, hanging dong out the emergency exit. (laughs) There you go. He destroyed Um, four American cities that way. Yeah. (laughs) And nine Japanese ones. He was kind of known for being like the boss. Like that's literally, that's what other wrestlers called him was the boss in the locker room. Um, and one of the kind of the things with Andre he was he was really the only guy in the business who would never lose. Right. If Andre's in a match, he's going to win the match. And one of the things that kind of what like and still everyone wanted to wrestle him, because like if you're a big regional wrestler, you want to wrestle, you want to lose to Andre the Giant and just lose well, because that can make your career. Right. Just fighting him can make your career because he's fucking Andre the Giant. Um, now the sheer ferocity of Andre's travel schedule and the social demands of stardom wore him down over time, as did his lifestyle. Being massive, he ate incredibly huge meals, but he also drank, uh, an estimated 7,000 calories of beer and wine per day. Yeah, at one did. point, yeah, he sure <laughs> did. Uh, at one <laughs> point he got into a contest with an Olympian named Chris Taylor that ended with Taylor tapping out at 126 bottles of beer and Andre drinking more than 147. <laughs> Good for that's both too, of them. So yeah, that's too much beer. <laughs> that is too much beer. Like, honest, uh, uh, honesty here. What's the most beer either of you have ever uh, drank? Like in the, say like a a day. Yeah, I mean maybe like thirty. You know, okay. and that was like that was intense. That was like regretted yeah. it for days. Yeah, like I've had twenty six before. I've never gotten yeah. to. 30. I think I've, yeah. I think I've been in the twenties. Okay. Yeah. So we um, all understand that 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 that's like a one time in your life you drink. Yeah. Like a quarter of what Andre did, kind of. Yeah, Andre, yeah. yeah, and it and you and it hurts you for possibly yeah, years. For sure. like, <laughs> it's it's one of those things that you kind of you have to do it when you're like yeah. twenty five because test like, your limits, you know. Yeah, I couldn't do that now. No, <laughs> oh God, no, no. I'd, yeah, I'd never I, wake up. It'd be real sad if we all did it now. But yes, yeah. <laughs> once or twice in your life, you got to party. You got to test the limits of your party. Yeah. Look at that event horizon. Of alcoholism. Yeah, you must taste the oblivion <laughs> of partying. Yeah. And with Andre, you know, part of why he drank so much is just that, like, it affected him less than it does people who are not seven foot four giants. And part of it was he was in horrible pain because his body was yeah. far too large for his back and his knees. Yeah. So even um, for Andre, there's some sadness behind those. Yeah, there, th- there is some. Sad- now, there's some funny stories, too, because like so one of okay. like when kind of Andre is uh, this is in kind of the mid 80s when he's sort of at his uh, near his at or near his height as a as a famous wrestler he and arnold schwarzenegger become friends and this is like peak bodybuilding almost peak bodybuilding yeah. arnold a little bit he past was the, that. the monster yeah. in uh Comando destroyer <laughs> yeah yeah exactly 
So the two of them go out like drinking and have a meal one night. Um, and at the end of the dinner, they have a fight over who's going to pay. Uh, and Arnold <laughs> tries to be like, I'm going to pay. And Andre the Giant picks him up, picks up Arnold Schwarzenegger and sets him in the eve of a window above them so that he can go pay. <laughs> like, like, lifts up like Arnold Schwarzenegger like I'm he's a giant doll. Let me <laughs> <down. laughs> like, like carrying a cat out of the room. Exactly. <laughs> to Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Get me down, I'm scared. God, he was so cool. <laughs> he's the coolest. <laughs> I went out with Wilt the Stilt that night because he was in Combat uh, Destroyer. Yeah, yeah, you have to assume so. You have to assume they just drank all of the liquor in that small oh, town. Oh man, that must have been cool. That must have been a cool <laughs> night. <Yeah. laughs> so by the time Vince takes over, he's already starting to look for Andre's replacement. You know, Andre is probably the biggest name in wrestling or close to it, you know, tied with a couple of other guys. Um, but he's also he's old, he's not able to move the way he was. It's kind of clear that he's on the down swing of his career. And Vince finds Andre's replacement in a young man named Terry Bolia. Now, Terry was just in his 20s when he'd started wrestling for the WWF. A child of the 1950s and of a dirt poor neighborhood in Port Tampa, Florida, Terry loved wrestling as had loved wrestling as long as he could remember. His favorite wrestler as a kid was Billy Graham, uh, yeah, who is the, uh, was. the younger brother of Vince's mentor, Dr. Jerry Graham, which is pretty cool. I, I do yeah. love that the Grahams had such an impact. Um Young Terry was particularly drawn to Billy because of his larger-than-life physique, including improbable 22-inch biceps. These muscles were the product of steroids, as Billy was among the first generation of wrestlers to get really into that shit. He evangelized them to other wrestlers, saying, You can feel your body stretch. Just lay in bed and you'll feel yourself grow. So <laughs> that's great. Good stuff. Okay. What? Okay, muscle yeah. wizard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Terry you're, starts you're out get infected <laughs> with strength. <laughs> so Terry It'll starts out, out of your chest <laughs> like a little creature. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry starts wrestling small time in Florida. Graham notices his skill and he buys him a drink one night in Tampa. And, and Bolia stated what everyone else knew by now. He's like, yeah, guys aren't breaking into the big leagues of wrestling anymore without chemical assistance. Um, yeah. And so young Terry is like, hey, I know that you kind of need to be roided out to some extent. You have to be larger than life to make it in this business now. What should I do to take my career to the next level? And Graham is like, you should take Diana Ball and Winstrol uh, and then chase them with Valium because that's what I do. Uh, great, <laughs> he great He's going to get some real like, you know, you got to get out there and grind. You got to try your best. But no, he's like, no, take this. Yeah. Chemical you have to muscle growth. If if you have any space in your ass that isn't drugs, you're doing it wrong. Mm. Like, <laughs> fill that butt. So, within the WWF, the, t the task of handing out steroids went to an osteopathic doctor named George Zahorian. Mm. Uh, he'd started as a house doctor for the McMahon's League and then became one of the chief state athletic representatives for Pennsylvania. He was required to examine every wrestler to see if they were healthy enough to perform. The allegation made later was that Vince, who was alleged to be a ster steroid user himself, would not so subtly encourage wrestlers to get bigger. This didn't take much of a push since it was obvious that only the monsters got the choice roles. So Dr. Zahorian would go through wrestlers one by one to check them out. He brought a doctor bag full of steroids, painkillers, and Valium with him and would ask, is there anything else you would like? If it isn't here, I can get it for you and send it to you. I honestly so, cannot imagine a more corrupt job than WWF house doctor. No, like you just doctor. say that and you're like, there's not a person in the world that doesn't immediately know no. what that means. I will note. There are. This is not an allegation that Vince or the WWF broke any laws because steroids are not illegal at this point, right? Okay, sure, right. right. Like this, this is like they like by just handing them out like candy. You're not necessarily breaking the law as a doctor. Um, no, maybe the yeah. Hippocratic oath. Maybe the maybe the Hippocratic oath. You know, we can argue that on a personal <laughs> level, but this is not like Vince. illegal drug dealing in the '80s, right? Listen, it's it's my sworn oath to make every one of these wrestlers' asses as hard as a concrete dipped horse. <laughs> so, Terry Bolia. Is that how they make statues? That is, that is, that is Sean. That's why Peta hates statues so much. 
Every one of them. Even the yeah. ones not of horses. Look. Right. You go to the Washington Monument. That's full of horses. It is horses all the way up that side. That's of a just 58,000 horses stacked <laughs> on top of each other. silently screaming from inside mm-hmm. every one of yeah. those. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happened to all of the horses from the South that we captured in the Civil War. Yep. That's how we punish them. Um, so, Terry Bolin. Your betrayal will be remembered forever, horse. <laughs> it would be very America if we just punished the horses for just the Just punish the horses, yeah. Or <laughs> well, there wouldn't have been a war if they hadn't carried them there. They were no, those horses were no angel. <laughs> Tell it to God. <laughs> So Terry Bolia is going to become the poster child of the success that steroid use could bring one of Vince's wrestlers. Um, He could not have succeeded in the business during an earlier era. Hulk Hogan, as he came to be known, was not a good technical wrestler. He never gets very good at the technical stuff. He's good at number one. He's a good performer in that he's like good at, you know, presenting uh, an appealing personality to the fans. And he's good at being a gigantic muscle freak. Right. Um, Yeah. Matches with him had to be kind of scripted to avoid some of the choreography that guys like um, 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 Brett Owen could have done, right? Or Brett Hart could have done. Um, sure. Yeah, you know, he's no honky uh, talk man. Yeah, well, yeah, he just he, <laughs> he simply as a doesn't have it. He was pretty great. Yeah, he and again, wrestling yeah. is. Uh, this has always been the case. We talked about this in that earlier age. You don't have to be a great technical wrestler to be a good wrestler. It's it's yeah. a different kind of things. Um, Hogan, though, uh, a lot of his early success comes from the fact that he is just so fucking big. Um, ten years after their meeting, superstar Graham met Hogan again at WrestleMania three, and he later told Inside Edition. We went off to a shower stall and Hogan pulled down his wrestling tights. I injected him with 600 milligrams of testosterone in the right buttock. He had scar tissue on his butt from so many injections over the years, and it was hard to shove the needle in. Jeez, hell yeah. <laughs> Gotta yeah. that leathery dinosaur skin. <laughs> he does He does have skin like a fucking leather jacket. Like, yep. he has Always the sunny. complexion of Indiana Jones's jacket. <laughs> Always sunny. They had that bit where they said he had the skin of a hot dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's perfect. Perfect analogy. It's yeah, genius. It is, it's ideal. <laughs> so, by the late 1980s, Hogan was the WWF's biggest star. Andre still drew crowds, but his body was by now very much failing him. Vince became aware that his former main draw was on the way out. Now, previously, Andre had been treated like a supernatural force. No one was ever allowed to actually beat him. And again, careers were made by just getting hits in against the giant. He was beloved. He was cheered every time he came on. He was kind of the ultimate baby face. But now Vince engineered a storyline to turn him into a heel. Andre was somewhat uncomfortable with the whole turn, but Vince executed it effectively, having the giant betray Hogan and turning him into an object of disdain for the audience. At WrestleMania 3, they cheered as, for the first time, Andre was beaten in the ring by Vince's new golden boy, Hulk Hogan. From here, Andre's career descended rapidly, and his last matches were a dispiriting series of villainous appearances. For the first time in his life, he was booed and jeered as he entered the stadium, an experience that his friends say caused him some amount of anguish as his body continued to fail him. That sucks. Yeah, making a big sweet man feel bad is, given the crimes this guy commits, is low on the list of Vince Mm -hmm. McMahon evil. But the way this all goes down says a lot about him. I I found a documentary. There's a documentary. It came out in 2018 by Bill Simmons, just titled Andre the Giant. I have a lot of criticisms of the documentary. There's a degree of whitewashing uh, in it that's that's pretty significant. But they get Vince to talk for it. And there's a moment in this that is extremely revealing. Uh, And I'm going to play that for you now. When his career was over, he had no value, you know, to himself. No longer am I going to be around the boys and socializing and things of that nature. I'm stuck here in North Carolina, and I was responsible for the fact that business was good and everybody else was going home laughing. Andre more or less wanted to blame me, you know, and resented me a bit because he knew the business was going to go on without him. I think Andre resented that a little bit too. This time was up, damn it, you know. And yet I was going to continue on. And sometimes it can even be a situation whereby, uh, well, you used me. No longer, when I was in Andre's presence, no longer was it this loving, warm admiration that we had for each other. It wasn't there. Now, there's something real... um, 
telling about that because he's characterizing something that is a normal practice in wrestling where mm-hmm. you can't st- you can't stay on top forever. The guy on top has to pass the belt on to sure. the next guy Abs- who's going to be on top. Yeah. That's just how the business works. However, Vince in this clip is ignoring the fact that Andre's career is ending because Andre is literally dying. Yeah. Like this is this is a unique situation. Like you didn't have to put the strap on Hogan like that. Yeah. By making by making Andre end his career as a bad guy. Uh, it, so he's that's so man it's, the whole there's, also, like, uh, there's no real fucking way to spin this uh, Andre hates me and there's a lot of good reasons for him to hate me and uh, yeah I really kind of <laughs> owned him there's also that very beginning line where he's like Andre was like he had no value and then he pauses a second and goes to himself to himself (laughs) it's like that's how Vince feels can't wrestle no more value and he has to be like oh no to himself he had no value wait let me fix it he's worthless (laughs) and has no self esteem all right fixed it there you go that's for your legacy uh, my good friend what a a piece of shit (laughs) (laughs) truth is Andre wasn't drawing anymore so (laughs) yeah Now, I will say this is not in that documentary because, again, it whitewashes some shit. But there was something else in Andre's uh, the fact that Andre in his late life seems to have hated Vince McMahon. Something else besides the fact that he'd been made into a heel uh, because Andre was very close to one of the earliest actual crimes that Vince has been accused of committing. Rita Chatterton was born in Albany in 1957. And she fell in love with wrestling as a little kid through her little brother, Christopher. He was obsessed with the pastime, and his life ambition was to go into wrestling. But in 1979, he died in a tragic car accident. Rita decided to become professionally involved in wrestling as a way to honor her younger brother's memory. She was 22 years old, working as a driver for Wonder Bread. Now, she'd had a lung injury earlier in life, so she was unable to actually be a female wrestler. But she realized that pro wrestling had never had a female referee. So she set herself to the task of getting that job. She gets licensed as a ref in the state of New York in 1984, and she almost immediately starts to work refing small regional shows. She's really good at this, and she develops a reputation for being competent and a good performer. And she's soon making a decent sideline doing these kind of three and 4,000 fan little venues. Um, so she's doing okay. She's she's supplementing her income when in January of 1955, three years into Vince taking over the WWE, he gives her a call. Now, at this point, Vince is kind of in the middle of his quest to take out the regionals, um, and he's launched a super uh, storyline in his own uh, in the WWF uh, involving a pop star named Cindy Lauper. And, and Cindy is like she's kind of a regular character in WWF events at this period of time. He's got her managing a lady wrestler, and he's also got her engaged in a kayfabe battle against a a wrestler who's kind of like he makes a misogynist so that it can be kind of a because women's rights is big at the time in the news, right? So Vince is like, we'll have Cindy Lauper be you know representing the ladies, and we'll have this wrestler be a bigot, and you know it, they it, solved it'll be it. all that thing, storyline right? solved women's rights. That is that is why it, that's that is where it came from. That's how it's the ERA got bastard. passed. Right. Yeah. Robert, Robert, I am white knuckling it through this story. <laughs> yeah, do you know what's coming, Tom? I don't. Oh boy. Oh boy. Um, it's not good. So uh Vince heard there was a young female ref that was working, you know, some regional shows. She'd done, I think, a couple of W smaller WWF affiliated gigs. Um, and so he's like, hey, we've got this kind of feminist storyline going on. Let's bring in this lady ref. That'll probably put some butts in seats. So so far, this is all fine. Obviously, it's a little bit cynical, but nearly all social prog- progress in this country involves cynical entertainment people increasing representation in order to make money and whatever. It's okay. Fair. So sure. he, he calls Rita up and he asks her to work at Madison Square Garden the coming week. She took the job and she did it quite well. Uh, McMahon called her afterwards and she later claimed, he said he was impressed with what I did, impressed with my work, and he wanted me to go full time. He promised me half a million dollars a year at a time. I knew that's a huge amount of money, but I didn't know what the wrestlers were making. And obviously she knows that guys like Hulk Hogan are rich as shit. So she's like, I don't know, maybe if I become a star referee, I could make that kind of money. Um, Obviously, very few people involved in wrestling made anything near that much money. And Vince had no (laughs) incentive to give a shitload of cash to her. Um, But, you know, she doesn't know that she's making the choice that that seems like the best choice for her at the time. Um, I'm going to quote next from a write up in New York magazine. Quote, McMahon also had a warning. 
Keep yourself clean, he said in Chatterton's telling. I don't want to see you messing around with any of the wrestlers. You keep it professional. Look. Yeah, so that's right. not great. Nope. Uh, not a great sign for where things are going. What the um, fuck? So I'm so, sorry. So this is this is going to get like, a lot of worse. To- have yeah. sex with, okay, okay. Yep, that's normal. his like first totally warning. Normal. So Rita's excited. She thinks she's gonna, this is gonna be the start of like a career and money and you know, it's this is great, right? She reaches out to a friend of her. She's got two good friends in the wrestling business. Um, and one of them is a wrestler. His last name's Inzatari. Um, and she tells him, hey, I'm gonna be on the cover of Women's Daily and Time and all these other magazines. And Inzatari is like, well, why do, you, why do you think that's gonna happen? And she's like, Vince promised it to me. And Inzatari's been in the business long enough, and he's like, oh, Rita, please, if you do anything with him, you're gonna be gone. Stay away from Vince, right? Like, that's his advice to her, is like, keep doing the job, don't, like, do do not, like, avoid Vince McMahon at all fucking costs, right? Um, And I think it's one of those things, he had heard rumors, it's not, you know, at this point, there's not anything kind of publicly out about Vince being a sex weirdo. But, you know, you work in the business, you hear, and he tries to warn his friend away. He's like, look, right. this is a bad guy to be fucking in business with. As a with. casual Time yeah. Magazine reader, he knew that yeah. they don't do a lot of cover features on <laughs> WWF <laughs> yeah. referees. Yeah. So, um, if you're in Rita's position, working as the first female ref in pro wrestling, and it seems like starting to succeed at a massive scale, though, like, how can you not move forward with this, right? And for a while, Vince kind of kept his promise. She kept getting brought in for very big matches. She gets a, a kind of a small part in a spread in Cosmo. Um, so she's like, like it's it sort of seems like this is starting to happen for her. She's optimistic enough about the future for good reason that she quits her job as a delivery driver. McMahon also had her on his unsuccessful cable talk show, Tuesday Night Titans. Uh, she wore a loose-fitting white dress, and McMahon praised her in ways that were vaguely off-putting, saying, you have been accomplishing things that certainly women have never accomplished before. I mean, you weigh approximately 120 to 130 pounds. Not getting personal, somewhere in there. And for you, to step into the ring with the giants. I mean, you realize what can happen to you, do you not? Now, what uh, does that mean? <laughs> I, that you could go I with think. crushed and not. Yeah, I, I mean, you molested. could go with crushed. I think he's trying to sell the danger of it because yeah. he's always that carnival barker. But also, I I don't want to be recorded giving Vince McMahon the benefit of the doubt. Right. No, that would be uh, absurd. Like you could, people at the time, you could give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, it's going to become very clear later. Right, that, out, uh, free yeah. of any context. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, let, let me let me rephrase it. Free of any context. That yeah. context. That is how I would interpret that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Now, for the most part, Vicky's pretty happy, but week after week and eventually months go by and the contract that Vince had promised her didn't show up. The Vicky half claimed, a million dollar referee uh, <laughs> contract didn't happen? That's <laughs> shocking. Happen. <laughs> so Vicky, I'm uh, sorry, Rita, I don't know why I said Vicky. Uh, Rita claims that she asked McMahon for an audience and he agreed to meet with her after a show. When she arrived for the meeting, a bunch of other industry p- people were there meeting with him. Uh, She tried to start a conversation during dinner, but he kind of brushes her off. um, And then he catches her as she's leaving the bathroom. Um, And he's like, hey, I don't want to talk to you about your career in front of all these other people. It's none of their business. Why don't we go to a second location and you get in my limo with me? Mm. All right, Rita. Yeah. Bring bring a knife. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Knife. Maybe like some kind of, I don't know, gun that launches mace. Uh, Mm. Yeah. Any of that. (laughs) Good idea. Um, obviously I, look, I'm not going to like, uh, beat around the bush here. Vince unzips his pants. Oh. Um, and oh, he man. propositions her. Uh, this is how Rita later describes what happens. Vince continued to, you know, if you want a half a million dollar contract, you're going to have to satisfy me. And this is the way things have to go. Vince grabbed my hand, kept trying to put my hand on him. I was scared at the end. My wrist was all purple, black and blue. Things Jeez. just didn't. He just God. He just didn't stop. This man mm. just didn't stop. According to Chatterton, the next thing that Vince says is, how's your daughter going to go to college? Of course, oh she God. doesn't have to go to college. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that she's not going to be able to afford it if she doesn't, you know. And it's yeah, like, obviously, that's what that means. this yeah. is both sexual harassment and also physical. Like, he's bruising her hand, right? This is not just even, like, not that it's okay to be creepy. Like, this is also physical, directly physical violence. Mm -hmm. Um, both of these things are occurring here. Um, so Chatterton later claims I was forced into oral sex with Vince McMahon. 
When I couldn't complete his desires, he got really angry, started ripping off my jeans, pulled me on top of him, and told me again that if I wanted a half a million dollar a year contract, that I had to satisfy him. He could make me or break me, and if I didn't satisfy him, I was blackballed. That was it. I was done. One of the things that sticks with me, and always will, was after he got done doing his business, he looked at me and said, Remember when I told you not to mess with any of the wrestlers? Well, you just did. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. What the f- what a yeah. psychopath, He's a man. fucking, yeah, he's, he's a giant, I mean, he's a fucking massive piece of shit. Uh, that's why we're spending six hours talking about him. Jesus um, Christ. Yeah, giant piece of shit. Um, so that's terrible. Um, in the immediate wake of this assault, uh, of this alleged assault, uh, Vic, Rita reached out to two colleagues in Zatari, and I mean, these are like the two guys that are her friends within the business. One of them is this guy in Zatari, and one is Andre the Giant. Um, so he is like one of the two people that she feels confident confiding in about what has happened to her. Um, which, uh, I don't know, might play into some of the reason why Andre hates Vince McMahon late in life. I would imagine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She and also speaks. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So she talks to a lawyer um, to kind of decide, can I sue Vince McMahon? Can I like press charges against him? But it is he is very powerful and wealthy at this point in time. It is not an easy it's not an easy thing to do when like it's the guy is like a fucking gas station attendant. Right. It's especially hard when it's fucking Vince McMahon. Um, And she's not sure if it's like worth the risk, in part because both of her parents are in poor health at this point. She's helping to take care of them. She's worried yeah. about the effect all of this will have on them. So she she works, keeps quiet for a while. She keeps working as a ref in smaller venues off and on through the early 90s. Um, when her father dies in 1992, she makes her first public allegation. Um, so like publicly uh, alleges that Vince uh, McMahon, you know, sexually assaulted her. Um, she goes on, you know, she's on a couple of different like TV shows and stuff talking about this. She's, she, she makes this as public as she possibly can. Um, we'll talk about this a little more in the next episode, but for Rita, her wrestling dream finally ended in 1993 after she attended Andre the Giant's funeral. Uh, Vince was also there and she recalls, quote, Vince walked up to me and said, it's nice to meet you. He knew exactly who I was. She adds. I said, it's nice to meet me. I told him to go fuck off and walked away. That seems. Yep. The least of what he deserves. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. He got off very light in that exchange. Yeah. Um, yep. So. Um, it's a perfect time to plug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vince McMahon. Uh, it's pretty bleak. Um, it's 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 bad. Bad times. All bad times. And we have one more terrible story about Vince McMahon. Um, And this kind of occurs contemporaneous to the other stuff. Uh, A lot of bad things are happening at once here. So you should have just told really happy Andre the Giant (laughs) stories. That would have been a more fun podcast. Uh, My uh, my buddy Tommy wrote for WWF for a while and he used to tell Andre the Giant stories. I don't want to like tell any of his, but he had one where. Ultimate Warrior got him some wine, and Andre's like, "This is not French wine, Warrior." <laughs> and so he sent Warrior like to Seven Eleven to get French wine, and, <laughs> and it was like so close to the show that he was already in his full Ultimate Warrior makeup. And in a full sprint, he like went into Seven Eleven to get a bunch of French wine. <laughs> and so this Seven Eleven clerk watched the Ultimate Fucking Warrior like burst into his store, <laughs> rummage through the liquor, and come out with all this wine. And uh, again. I, I don't remember how that story ended, but I just remember awesome. like 20 people <laughs> laughing at this. Uh, and yeah, he, he just yeah. had a million. Like, that's all Andre the Giant did was fucking drink and make awesome shit happen. Yeah, <laughs> there are there's there are a couple of funny stories about him getting like drunk enough that he passed out, passes out in like hotel lobbies and stuff. And them just having to be like, well, let's put a blanket on him. No, what you yeah. can't move him. This is a real problem. Like, yeah. He is, like a, he is like an a impassable. It's like a hedgerow. Yeah. Yeah. We need a, a Bangalore him. torpedo to get through him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so at around the same time, I would just time, curl up and snuggle on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? I know where I'm <laughs> sleeping tonight. <laughs> at around the same time, Rita was starting her career as a referee. Vince got himself into an even worse situation, maybe. 
Um, I don't know. I, it's it's a bad, another terrible situation. Let's put it that mm-hmm. way. One of his top babyface wrestlers was a guy named Jimmy Superfly Snuka. Yes. Uh, Snuka had oh, started yeah. dating a young Brooklyn girl named Nancy Argentino. She was working as a dental assistant. A friend of hers had started dating another wrestler. So she goes to shows with them and she meets Snuka. Um, so she winds up becoming Snuka's driver as well as his girlfriend because Jimmy was hooked on every drug conceivable and was never in the same galaxy as sober enough to drive. He was a maximum lunatic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the most extreme <laughs> yeah. lunatic. In very short order, the two start fighting. Uh, and on January 18th of 1983, the police are called to a hotel in Salina, New York for a domestic disturbance between them. It wound up taking a whole team of cops to subdue Snuka, who was at that that point about 85 percent trend and cocaine by body weight <laughs> um now snuka kind of like one of the things that happens during this fight when the police show up is that argentino runs out of a room to like tell the cops what he's been doing and while the cops are there he grabs her by the hair and drags her face across the drywall um her the injuries that she's got include she's got a contusion in the neck she has possible fractured ribs her lower back is injured Snuka oh. gets initially charged with assault and resisting arrest. Um, obviously, Vince, you know, this is a problem. Snuka is a, a fairly prominent wrestler. He's got to deal with this. He does not care that this guy has just beat the absolute shit out of a young woman. Um, and uh, yeah, he's he's uh, like kind of his immediate plan is I have to go into damage control mode. And according to an investigation by wrestling journalist David Bixen span, um, Argentina was initially trying to pursue criminal charges against Snuka, but she kind of suddenly makes a change to signing an affidavit claiming that she was in no way seeking prosecution against him. We don't know exactly what happened, um, but a police report was covered, uh, uncovered fairly recently that shows that Vince, Mc- I think this was a part of Josie Reisman's reporting, that shows Vincent McMahon tried to talk her out of making a complaint against Snuka in the first place. Um, and as a result, Snuka winds up pleading guilty to harassment, but has his other charges dropped. He makes a donation to the Ronald McDonald House charity, but otherwise suffers no consequences. Later that year, on May 10th, Snuka called the paramedics to his hotel room because Argentina was Argentina was an unconscious and obviously dying. Snuka first claimed that they had a fight. Uh, he framed it as a playful thing that they had been play wrestling and she'd hit her head and he thought she was OK until she had trouble breathing the next day. Uh, she gets taken to the ER where she dies the next day at 1.50 a.m. Um, the coroner sees enough evidence of violence to suggest a police interview. He believes it's a homicide. So they take Snuka in for questioning. Uh, Don Maracco, another wrestler staying at the same hotel, claims that he has a call with Vince at the same time. Quote, Vince says, have you ever heard anything about Snuka and his girlfriend? Maracco says, I said, as a matter of fact, I am here with Lieutenant so-and-so. So I put him on the phone to Vince. Now, this is the same time that Vince is in the final stage of taking ownership of the WWF. He has reason to fear that a murder scandal involving one of his top wrestlers could blow everything up. We have we do not know what he said to the cops or to Snuka, but the next day Snuka changes his story. Instead of this play wrestling bit, he tells cops that like they'd been driving and she'd gotten out to pee in some bushes and she'd slipped and hit her head on the pavement. And that's what caused the injury. Right. Reisman in her book notes that decades later, a wrestler who was trying to defend Snuka in a documentary interview would tell the crew that he had been in a car with them that morning and had no memory of any injury that she suffered by the roadside. He kind of accidentally blows up one of Snuka's claims. Um, Snuka holds to that story forever, though, that she just hits her head, you know, in a freak accident, and that's what causes all this. The WWF does cooperate with the investigation, and eventually Snuka is released. He is not charged with any crime, despite the fact that the coroner had advised the case be investigated as a homicide. Josie writes... Argentino's younger sister, Luis uh, Argentino, would later recall that Vince or one of his proxies, she didn't remember the name and just called him Snuka's promoter, called Argentino's mother not long after her daughter was buried. Miss Argentino, I'm so sorry for your loss, the sister remembered him saying. Do you think $25,000 would help you? The mother hung up on him. Ugh. Gross. Yep. Now. Yeah, I mean, we live in a universe where, like, cocaine filled Jimmy Snuka might accidentally kill somebody by like shoving them and they hit their head on something. And I'd be like, that's within the realm of possibility. But then he's like, Oh no, no, no. It happened earlier when 
uh, she got out of the car and slipped and fit. Like, okay, you're a murderer. Like, like mm-hmm. that sort of clinches it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And the, the history of they, they, they had a long history of yes. domestic violence. Right. And that yeah, doesn't help either. I'm saying there's a world where that story didn't exist. And you're just saying, hi, I'm a gigantic dude. And uh, yeah, we were making love and I hit her head on the board or whatever. But yeah, that didn't happen. I, I don't know why I'm even bringing up yeah. a hypothetical. Yeah. That's yeah. a murderer. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're obviously yeah. a murderer. You're yeah, yeah. Obvi- a murderer. This is very, very clearly a fucking yeah. murder, right? Um, there's a little more to it in terms of Vince's sketchiness here. Um, we know that Vince walked into a meeting with Snuka and the DA, the medical examiner, and several cops on June 1st, which is the same day he makes his final payment to his dad for the WWF. Now, the DA at this meeting later recalls that Vince did all the talking. Snuka himself later wrote this cryptic paragraph about the meeting for his autobiography. At one point, I went with Vince McMahon Jr. to either a court or a law office. I don't remember which because I was still in shock. All I remember is he had a briefcase with him. I don't know what happened. I think Vince Jr. picked me up from the hotel and took me there. He didn't Maybe say it was anything a bus. to me. Maybe it was a spaceship. <laughs> yeah. I'm a maniac. <laughs> Could now, have been a tractor. <laughs> There are a lot of conspiracy theories about that briefcase because Vince doesn't carry a briefcase, right? Everyone who's like been in meetings with him says that like this is a weird thing for him. That's kind of why Snuka wrote it, right? Is that Snuka's known him a while. He hasn't seen him do this before. We don't know anything more than this. Um, There are a ton of conspiracy theories that, oh, did he have a bribe in the briefcase for the cops or, you know, whatever. There's not evidence of this. It's just something there's there's a lot of theories about, right? Um, I think that there's plenty without him bribing the cops. There's plenty of shadiness here Mm -hmm. to like make this be a mark in the bastard column for Vince McMahon. Um, Oh, sure. He didn't, he didn't even need to do something as, as ostentatious as bring a briefcase full of money. He had plenty of power and influence to make something happen. Pat Patterson had a long running prank where they would trick each other into looking at each other's poop. So there could have been a human turd in that briefcase. Right. <laughs> could have just been completely unrelated to the case. Uh, he was just getting this show Pat Patterson his shit later. I was at I gotcha, a, a big, you big thought outdoor I, He wouldn't do it here, but I got you again, Pat. <laughs> yeah, you thought I wouldn't do this when trying to talk a wrestler out of a murder charge, but <laughs> by God, I got you again. <laughs> Um, that does remind I have a I have a good poop in a suitcase story. So I'm at this big outdoor party, this big like festival, you know, event in Texas, uh, sure. kind of near Texarkana one time. And um, I've got some friends who are are part of this group at this festival that like their their primary thing is doing like light terrorism, right? Where they they just kind of try to mess with people while they're on drugs and having a good time. And a couple of them would go around the event with a suitcase full of peanut butter, <laughs> trying to get people to eat out of the suitcase full of peanut butter. Um, it was offered to me several times and I knew them well enough to be like, I am not going to eat out of that peanut butter suitcase. And sure enough, it later comes out that somebody had shat in the peanut butter oh, suitcase. God. <laughs> oh yeah, and God. you call that light terrorism. <laughs> light that terrorism. Is, that yeah. is a fucking six out of 10 terrorism to me. Yeah. Oh boy. There's a couple of people in Texas that are going to know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and they're going to be shocked that that wasn't peanut butter. <laughs> Yeah. Hope you didn't eat the fucking peanut butter. Uh, Good stuff. Well, speaking of Cobra Venom, today we're about to right now, we're going to talk about a man who who could drink raw Cobra Venom uh, and and feel nothing. Uh, A hero I think we're all familiar with Jesse the Body Ventura. We all um, love Jesse. Yeah, everyone loves Jesse. <laughs> and there's very few people that Jesse hates more than Vince McMahon. <laughs> so born. Yeah. And this is as a result of it being a story about Jesse, the body Ventura. Uh, this is going to be a story about Vince McMahon as well. And a story about unions. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, strap in here. Born James George Janos, uh, which is not nearly as good. And I can see why he went with Jesse Ventura. Um, James George Janos, just not the, not the same kind of, but it's also not, not a wrestling name. No, no, it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. JJ. Um, I'd go with JJ Janos. Um, That's Janos Janos, the hands of fate. You know, there's a lot of name of a champion. (laughs) 
So born in 1951, Jesse is the a child of Minneapolis. Um, his parents were World War II veterans, both of them. Um, and his older brother served in Nam. Uh, Jesse opted to join the Navy in 1969 rather than be drafted. Um, and he was, you know, you've seen if you've seen Jesse the Body Ventura when he was young, he's a very fit guy. He's he's pretty large and frightening. So his superiors are like, this guy, we should maybe, you know, uh, put in for some more intense training. So they wind up sticking him in a program called Buds, which is like underwater demolition. Basic underwater Basic, demolition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Janos. Yeah, <laughs> Janos. <laughs> so, without getting into like too much military nerd stuff, this is Buds is what becomes the Navy SEALs, right? Like the Navy SEALs kind of evolve out of this elite underwater demolition program. Um, there will be some conflict later with Chris Kyle, uh, the American sniper guy who uh -huh. is oh, yeah. kind of a dick. Um, and he'll accuse Jesse the Body Ventura of lying about having been a SEAL. Basically, everyone agrees it's f fine for him to call himself a SEAL. Like, they turned into the Navy SEALs right after he was in there. It's it's whatever. It's okay. That's a um, real technicality. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to call that sniper. one stolen valor. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. We're really <laughs> yeah. splitting hairs. And, and Jesse doesn't have that many of them. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he doesn't have any room for splitting. Yeah, um, <laughs> he's got to keep what he's got. So he's stationed in Vietnam. He's like he is a Vietnam veteran, but he never he never winds up in like combat or anything like that, which is which is good. It's combat's bad. <laughs> you want to avoid it as a general rule. Um, he is able to transition to civilian life, um, and he does so with the help of the Mongols Motorcycle Club, uh, which is based out of, I think, San Diego at the time. And kind of not long after he's in there, they wind up in this like really bloody gang thing with the Hells Angels. Jesse actually winds up um, testifying on their behalf at one point to be like, well, when I was in them, it wasn't like a criminal gang, whatever you want to say about them. Like they didn't start out as like part of a criminal enterprise. You know, they really had my back. They helped me transition into civilian life, which is like that's why motorcycle gangs start up, by the way. Like the, the first of them come up after World War Two as like a thing for vets who can't really fit in with the rest of society. Whatever. Mm -hmm. That's how okay. Jesse gets out of being in the military. Um, he transitions, you know, back to civilian life. Um, and he he decides like, well, now that I'm back in, you know, the normal world, nothing makes more sense than getting incredibly jacked and working as a bodybuilder. Um, and after getting incredibly jacked, because he's this huge dude who has military training, he's able to get a gig working as a bodyguard for the Rolling Stones. He's like, whenever the Rolling Stones uh, come to Minnesota, Jesse Ventura is uh, is is watching <laughs> their back. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Get me Janos. Yeah, yeah, get me Janos. That's, I mean, that's a pretty cool gig, except for yeah. Rolling Stones bodyguard is a job with a body count. Um, but that's not his fault, right? Sure. That's the Hells Angels, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so because he's, you know, this giant guy who's great at fighting, um, it kind of increasingly becomes clear to him that the real way for him to make some money off of his most evident assets is to get into pro wrestling. Now, he knows that Janos is not the best name he could possibly have. Hard he disagree. Wow. Wow. <laughs> do you want it? Do you know why he picks Jesse the Body Ventura? Uh, probably to sound more like Hulk Hogan or more so Californian. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. more California. That's exactly right. He wants to his like initial like the the kind of like theme of his character is he's like a Southern California muscle beach bodybuilder guy. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that's why that's why he does it better than a um, Minnesota maniac. I suppose. No, no, no. <laughs> better than. A, and this is the real stolen valor. There's yes. a lot of right. muscle freaks in Southern <laughs> California that Jesse's taken work from. His neon shorts are the stolen valor. Yeah. <laughs> kind of guy who's fine with him calling himself a Navy SEAL, but livid about the last name Ventura. You're not from Ventura Beach. Come on. <laughs> You've never rollerbladed in your life. <laughs> so he gets involved in wrestling in the early 70s. And at first he's kind of like he's basically like starts off his favorite. This is, again, a pretty common story. His favorite wrestler is superstar Billy Graham. Um, which is the same guy that like Hulk Hogan, yeah, you know, that's... learns, learns to be Hulk Hogan from, um, great wrestler, superstar Billy Graham. Um, if you want to look up pictures of him, incredible looking fellow, like he's, he's really one of the, he's really, if you want to pick one wrestler as like the physical dividing line between like huge guys, pre steroids, huge guys, post steroids, superstar Billy Graham is about your best bet. Um, real cool looking dude. So. <laughs> 
He's uh, a <laughs> really he, he split loved, the timeline. Yeah, really Billy split Graham. that timeline. Yeah, he's the he's the he's like the uh, the the fucking um, the KT boundary for wrestling and steroids. <laughs> um, so, yeah, his career goes pretty well until 1984. Jesse's like steadily moving up. At his peak, he's like a rival to Hulk Hogan. He has like these three consecutive matches against him and he loses them. But like, obviously, the fact that you're like build next to Hulk means that you're doing pretty good, you know, in 1984. Um, and then kind of at the peak of his wrestling career, he has to quit because he nearly dies. He develops like a series of nearly fatal blood clots in his lungs. Um, his like wife has to fly in because she thinks that he's like not lo- he's like about to die. Like it's very he comes very close to like leaving this earth as a result of it. Um, now, one of the interviews I read with him, Jesse claims that his Navy training taught him how to deal with the trauma of imminent Hell death. Yeah, it does. He, <laughs> yeah. he, he snuck inside his own lungs and stabbed yeah. the blood clots to death. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's, I, I, I had a, anyway, uh, so he, he thinks that the blood clots that he nearly died from were caused by his Agent Orange exposure in Vietnam. I, I mean, I have no way of proving that, but. Maybe uh, yeah. it it yeah it probably wasn't it, good for him. It couldn't have helped. Yeah. Uh, some yeah, like half a million help, people yeah. die from Agent Orange, so you know, a pretty pretty decent chance actually. Um, and this may explain why he becomes an anti-government conspiracy theorist uh, in the in the not too distant future. Not a bad <laughs> reason to become an anti-government conspiracy theorist. Absolutely, it may, guess, it may, it may, yeah. it may explain it in more than one way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. His government yeah. literally tried to kill him. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a it's a genuine <laughs> conspiracy, and also his brain was poisoned. Yeah, it's it is one of those. We'll talk about this more, but like, there's the 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 thirty thousand foot view of Jesse Ventura, where it's like, wow, that guy looks like a kook. And then in most situations, the closer you get to him, the more you're like, no, I mean, he, I kind of get where he's coming from. I yeah. understand you, Jesse. <laughs> There's a few exceptions to that, but less sure, than you'd think. Sure, he's he's <laughs> never a guy that I'm comfortable getting totally getting behind, but sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I always got well, the idea that he was a reasonable man and like he could correct mistakes and sort of shoot straight, but he's such a a, a monster that like who's going to correct him? I feel like that's yeah. like where he landed where he's he's capable of being wrong and fixing his yeah. behavior, but who could possibly stand up and do that? I, I described him recently as a basically decent man who read too many books about Atlantis to be truly yeah. sane again. Like right. that's, 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 my, that's kind of where I find Jesse. I'll tell you what, Mac man, they've got a city down there. Beneath the it's depths. called Lemuria. <laughs> he just needs to be an Atlantean. And it'll be so yeah. straight. And Jesse the body be like, oh, I met. I met someone from down there. I was, I had a lot of wrong impressions. <laughs> I tell you what, Mac man, if you can find Poseidon's trident down there, you can breathe forever. <laughs> he's, he's slow enough now that we can make these jokes. He's not catching us. Yeah. We'll oh, yeah. <laughs> so, 1984, he's out of commission because of this lung thing, but he's still pretty popular. And Vince, you know, say what there's a lot. I mean, we are saying what we will about Vince. He's pretty good at like recognizing talent. And he sees like, well, this guy can't wrestle right now, but I don't want to just like throw away money. And he's got some skill. Like he's 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 really good at talking. People seem to like enjoy his personality. Uh, As uh, as Jesse later said, I was out of commission, but Vince doesn't want you not working no matter what ails you. So he came up with the idea and asked if I could do color commentating. And I said, sure, he deserves the credit for thinking it up. I've always given the man credit. He's the P.T. Barnum of this generation. Um, Accurate. Up a lot. That P.T. Barnum comparison. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I I don't I don't know that. Hmm. That's actually an interesting question, because I would argue that Vince might not necessarily be the best at picking talent. He's always I feel like he's always been a guy that's best at noticing marketability, which is a little different. Yeah, I mean, that that's fair. I think they wind up like sometimes working similar. Of course, of course, there's a there's a. There's testimony that I read through where Vince is testifying to the Waxman Committee in 1996 about a bunch of shit that we're going to talk about, the steroids and and safety precautions and stuff. But they ask him during this how talent gets picked and like the way in which it works when like someone is a new wrestler. At what point does Vince come in and start having an influence on their career and kind of shaping their storylines? And it's he seems to use kind of the rest of the company and lower level employers as like um, a talent filter. And by the time someone's kind of proven themselves, he seems to be pretty good at like figuring out 
what about them is working and then exploiting that in order to make more money out of them. Right. For that's sure, something he's sure. good at. Yeah. And he, you know, he's got scouts and managers and everything mm-hmm. that watch that stuff for him. It's just, I sure. say that just because Vince is, I mean, we've already identified a few, but has very famously backed some terrible. He, yes. <laughs> he has. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is like um like with Steve Jobs, you know, like it, he, the, man, the man had some good ideas, but we've got the Newton in there, too. You know, like there's <laughs> there's a lot of crap that winds yeah. up getting out. Um, and, you know, Jeffrey Katzenberg was behind some stuff that worked and also Quibi. So, you know, mixed mixed bags all around right. with entertainment <laughs> people. Uh-huh. Everybody's got their Eugene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Eugene. Oh, yeah. my God. Oh, and glorious. Mantar. Yeah, yeah, great Man, stuff. Mantar's a ten out of ten. <laughs> yeah, Mantar, Mantar, you can actually go back and appreciate Eugene. Mm-hmm. Those those tapes cannot see the light of day. <laughs> the, the day Eugene walked out for the first time, I said, "There's no fucking way they're doing this." <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that that might actually be the most offensive wrestling story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm we may get to, to think that of one. A worse one. <laughs> So maybe um, maybe when May Young gave birth to a hand, <laughs> wrestling. We're actually about to talk to one that might be close to that. So Excellent. Vince, this says a decent amount about the man. Before Jesse goes out for his first night doing color commentating, Vince gives him some advice that I think kind of lays out how Vince McMahon sees like life in general like i think he just kind of inadvertently gave jesse the body ventura like his his perspective on on the world uh quote the first night i was going to broadcast vince pulled me aside vince said jesse here's your thought process and here's the best way for you to operate he said very simply if you believe it then it's true beautiful and words yeah, of wisdom yeah yeah sure uh, that, vince that, could have writ- wrote the secret yeah, that, I mean, that is how like, you know, if you're if you're like the job, as we said, of like the refs and the commentators is to sell fantasy to the audience. But also like that's kind of how b- being an entertainer works a lot of the time. Right. Yeah, like, that's like that's like yeah. acting advice. Yeah, it's acting. I mean, honestly, like there's a degree. It's like writing fiction to a degree. Like you're sitting down with a blank page and you're like inventing a guy in a world that shit happens in. Like you've got to kind of sell it to people. You have to right. make them yeah, make if, them if you, feel if you're it. Not, yeah. yeah, if you're not buying yeah. it, like everybody can tell immediately. But it, it's also exactly how a con artist has to think, right? Like Jesse's or um, 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 Vince is kind of at the intersection of of all of the creative arts, but he definitely lands more on like the cult leader con artist uh, end of the scale. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of at least the 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 way. And I mean, it's also. You, you see like kind of shades of his dad here, right? Where like, I'm sure when his dad is with these wrestlers being super nice, getting them on his side, um, there was a degree of him that like believed what he was saying that like could commit to the act. And then as soon as he's away from those wrestlers, fuck them, let's get every dime out of them we can, you know? Um, it's it's yep. compartmentalization, you know? Um, anyway, that's, that's, that's enough of that. So, uh, Jesse did eventually recover enough to wrestle in the ring, but he was more popular as a commentator after this point. Probably the weirdest example of this came in December of 1985 when he and Roddy Piper attacked a wedding between two characters affiliated with a group of wrestlers known as the Hillbillies for reasons that are, I I shouldn't have to explain. Um, Next in our five-part series of the Hillbilly <laughs> Wedding. Yeah. yeah, so <laughs> for reasons that have not, I, I have read several explanations of this. None of them make much sense to me. The New Jersey State Athletic Control Board will not allow the WWF to stage a fake wedding. Okay. I don't know why they get to make that decision. That doesn't seem like it's in their wheelhouse, but they're <laughs> right, not allowed. Where's the, where's the overlap there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why not? What's the problem with a fake wedding? Yeah. What did you marry, Vince? <laughs> yeah. One of, one of these people married a horse and it was yeah. your fault and New Jersey knows it. <laughs> this is an area where I will say like the regulators were maybe getting a little bit, uh, getting a little bit handsy here because that doesn't make much sense to me. But the two characters getting married for this fake wedding are also fiancés in real life, so they agree to have an actual in-ring wedding that will be broken up by a mass red- uh, wrestling melee. Now, Ventura insists that he's under orders from Vince during this to bury the two hillbillies getting married. Vince is basically like, I want you to make 
like insult them as badly as you possibly can. <laughs> like really hurt these people when you're out on stage, like fuck them up with your voice as badly as possible. And so Jesse makes a point of insulting them as badly as possible. Kind of the line that everyone takes out of this is he says that when these two who are actual fiancés, he says that when they kiss, quote, it looked like two carp in the middle of the Mississippi River going after the same piece of corn. <laughs> um <laughs> It's, it's, it's beautiful God. in its way. It is poetic. Damn, yes, that's, that's not a bad line, God. but oh, that's damn. also pretty mean. It's very <laughs> mean, savage, yeah, but whimsy, whimsical enough that like it's yeah. hard to take personal, right? Yeah, like, yeah, it's, well, it's, he's, it's he's he's the bad guy in the situation. Yeah, too, he's so. he's a heel. Yeah, yeah, it's cruel in a way that's impressive. I don't know where you want to mark that on like the bastard scale for Vince, but I thought it merited <laughs> inclusion. Um. Anyway, in terms of the actual real bastard shit, Jesse became acquainted with Vince's dark side after he made the transition to being a movie star, thanks to his memorable role in the 1987 classic Predator, a film that contains the only lessons a young person needs to be successful in life. Don't Accurate. don't send kids to school. Make them watch Predator. Just watch That's, Predator. Uh, yeah, just watch Predator enough. Uh, step one. Mm-hmm. Uh, make sure you don't got time to bleed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, step two, find something that'll turn See, you into a sexual Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> that's more stolen valor from Jesse because he did take almost a year to bleed. Um, <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> that's fucking meaner than the carp one. <laughs> that is pretty bad. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So since he was now an actor, Jesse qualified for the Screen Actors Guild and he joins SAG and he's like, man, there's there's a lot of nice stuff about being in a union. (laughs) Union This is is full of benefits for me. (laughs) Um, And then he kind of looks back at his previous career in wrestling and all of his colleagues and like they're desperately low pay, like there's zero benefits. The fact that they are all destroying their bodies at like a pace heroin addicts would consider excessive and goes. Maybe we should have a union. <laughs> this oh. this might make sense. I bet Vince loved that. <laughs> yeah, Vince is going to handle this well. Yeah, v- Vince and the Hulkster both are huge fans <laughs> of this idea, as so I recall. Re- WrestleMania two comes around and Jesse kind of gets everyone together in the locker room when they're when they're getting ready. And he's like, hey, guys, you know, he, he characterizes this as a speech to the boys. And he's like, look, you know, we need a union. We're getting fucked the, here's the different things I think we should go for. And the only thing to do is to like threaten to work stop it, say this is what we want and we won't go out there. Re- like the whole business at this point in, in WWF history relies on WrestleMania. If WrestleMania is a flop, like Vince is fucked. Like Vince is maybe irreparably fucked. Like the first WrestleMania was like really a gamble that he bet the whole fucking house on. Um, and at WrestleMania too, like it's still one of those things. If they were to like just not go out and the event collapses, that's like they really did have a lot of leverage. And he's like, look, man, we should go. We should threaten a work stoppage if we don't get if Jesse doesn't agree to recognize our union and come to the table and let us negotiate for a better deal. Right. Um, And he's also like, and I think this is pretty smart of Jesse. He's like, look, and while we're here, you know, there's all these locals in Charlotte who are fans of us. They're not fans of just the WWF. They like love us as wrestlers. We can get them on our side. We can get all this local support. We have the ability to really put Vince over a barrel here. Let's fucking do it. Um, You know, there's a it's kind of, you know, there's at least some interest from people in the night when they're talking about it. Um, Jesse's basically like, don't bring this up to Vince. You know, we're talking about a thing that could get us all in a lot of trouble. Um, And then he goes home feeling pretty good about the meeting. But the next day he gets a call from Vince uh, and says, quote, he basically threatened to fire me if I ever brought it up again and read me the riot act. So when I came back to Vince, I told him point blank, Vince, I won't ever bring up union again. I said, if these guys are too stupid to fight for their rights, I have my union now. He's talking about SAG there. Mm -hmm. So basically he, he gets called by Vince, which lets him know somebody ratted me out. And so Jesse's kind of like, well, fuck it. You know, I guess that's, that's the shot. It was Um, Jim, the anvil nightheart. (laughs) <laughs> oh no he knows what he did <laughs> um uh, tragically no uh this is gonna hurt uh a, a lot of us who were oh, who were no. children with hearts in the late oh, I know not my hulkamania <laughs> yeah, yeah it's the hulkster <laughs> yeah because if they so, get a union he makes it, way less money it, yeah 
It is, in fact, the Hulkster. <laughs> so for years, Jesse knew, obviously he knows immediately someone ratted on me, but he doesn't know who. And this is kind of a mystery for him, you know, as he leaves, he stops being, you know, in the WWF, um, he starts doing other shit. In 1991, he finds out that Vince McMahon, he's, uh, so it becomes out that like Vince had told his wrestlers that they would be getting like royalty payments, I think from videotape sales, but he like fucks them in a way that's illegal. And Jesse finds out and he sues and he wins the lawsuit against Vince over these royalty payments. But as a result of that, there's a deposition and I'm going to quote now from a write up on this deposition in the sportster. Vince McMahon admitted under oath that Hulk Hogan had snitched on his fellow wrestlers in 1986, and he came away to Vince McMahon and informed him about Ventura trying to get people together to form a union. Um, So, you know, it comes out that the Hulkster has betrayed Jesse Ventura. And on a pretty recent podcast with Stone Cold Steve Austin, Jesse said, it was like someone punched me in the face. This was my friend. And I thought, Hogan betrayed me? Hogan called Vince and ratted me? It's a... It's a tragic story, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a real bummer, uh, bummer about the Hulkster bummer that that Jesse got betrayed. I do feel like if you're a wrestler, you shouldn't compare betrayal to getting punched in the face because getting punched in the face is like things working well. <laughs> right. like, that, that is the job, is it normally? Right, it's like not getting punched correctly. in the face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the good news on this story, at least, is that unlike every other wrestler we've talked about, Jesse has about as happy an ending as it can have, because he's actually lived a pretty amazing life. Um, he goes on to be elected in 1999 the governor of Minnesota. He's not a bad governor. It's not like Arnold, where like he's this kind of right-wing ghoul for, you know, or at least like normal right-wing governor and then kind of becomes a, 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 a more progressive person afterwards. Jesse, despite being like a hardcore libertarian, like immediately his, his so he, number one, because he wins this kind of surprising victory, the Republicans, and the Democrats hate him. But the thing that he makes like his central campaign issue is establishing a light rail system for Minnesota and like connecting the Twin Cities via light rail. And he has to like go to fucking war in order to push this light rail system through. But he's like, why they have it, which is pretty dope. Yeah. Um, he also overhauls the property da- tax system to reduce the tax burden on poor people, which is also Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um, He's surprisingly progressive on gay rights for a governor in the late 90s, early 2000s. And he wrote it. One of the things that's interesting, I I checked in on like his opinions on some recent stuff because I was like, man, there's no way Jesse the body Ventura Ventura has like a good take on, you know, like the trans, you know, stuff going around on the right right now. But in, in 2016, he actually wrote a whole article on his blog about the the bathroom bills going around and was like. You know, I think this is bullshit. Uh, You shouldn't be fucking with people like this. Trans people have enough problems to deal with. And then he explained that when he was a wrestler, he doesn't say who it was, but one of his best friends in the WWF was a gay guy who had a partner who got really sick. And he was like, and, you know, my friend couldn't visit his his partner in the hospital. And that really broke my heart. And it was like the thing that caused me to realize, you know, that this was a really unjust system. So that's kind of, that's, yep. that's nice. You know, Good Jesse. Yeah. All right, Jesse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it gets all writer because Jesse also becomes a professional conspiracy theorist. At one point he hosts the TV <laughs> sure show does. conspiracy theory with Jesse Ventura, which is quite charming. He also guests on Infowars several times, although uh-huh. this is, this is during the era when like Noam Chomsky's on Infowars. So it, you didn't have to be like a howling fascist to be on the show. And he's usually talking about. So like the specific thing that Jesse is really into is the conspiracy the- theory that the CIA uses HARP, the high frequency active auroral research program to control the weather as like a super weapon. Um <laughs> It's it's That's pretty funny. Fun. That's harmless <laughs> yeah. fun. Yeah, it's pretty funny. There's some like good. <laughs> There's there's a really funny clip from the oh I thought I'd had it in here but I I, I oh wait no, no no I think it's uh ah shit uh one sec tease me like this Robert yeah there's don't a, uh, okay there's a clip it, it, in your I, I just had I had it in the wrong position so I want to play you a clip from um or at least force Sophie to play you a clip from um this uh this episode of conspiracy theory where he talks about the CIA weather control machine Sophie will you play that first Daily Motion link yeah. Glory.
<laughs> that's so funny. Okay. That's that's all I wanted to show you. <laughs> he floats that. He floats yeah, that. Like, no, absolutely not. Yeah, but- You're saying if this ten dollar bill fell out of my pocket, I could go inside. I'm absolutely not saying that, Mister Ventura. That's that's pretty funny. And it's a pretty harmless conspiracy theory to believe in. I encountered a conspiracy theory about this conspiracy theory on Twitter, and I forgot who told it to me. I apologize for stealing from you, but it's too fascinating not to say. And this this guy's theory was that Jesse became a believer in like the CIA weather control weapon conspiracy theory because he watched an old G.I. Joe cartoon. Oh, um, yeah. And yeah, it is true in 1984, the same year that Jesse spent a bunch of time bedridden and sick because of his blood clots, G.I. Joe, The Revenge of Cobra, a TV miniseries aired, which focused on a Cobra plot to control the world using the weather yeah. dominator. So it is not impossible that Jesse's like hallucinating and like sick and thinking about Agent Orange when he like flips past this G.I. Joe miniseries on oh, TV. Damn. Damn then, yeah, it could like be a true. Fever dream of his years in Vietnam. Think of the joy he must feel every yeah. day if he thinks G.I. Joe is real. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Sergeant that, Slaughter was in it. He probably knows yeah. Sergeant Slaughter. He killed yeah. Nemesis Enforcer with an elbow drop. Look, I, I don't know that we've tested to see if, like, that's not a, a side effect of Agent Orange exposure. <laughs> <laughs> is what um, believing G.I. Joe is real? Yeah, it's possible, Tom. You can't prove it's, it's not. They, l- listen, we can't we can't test for stuff we don't know what we're testing yeah. for. So the, the, the DOD's no trying to keep a lid on this shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta blow it open. One of the things that uh I can't the, so I, again, with kind of Jesse being the guy that he is, um, you get a lot of like people who kind of just sort of assume, especially because he's been on InfoWars, that he's like He's in sort of the Alex Jones sphere and that he probably has a lot of really bad takes on a lot of things. I'm not going to say he doesn't have. We all have some bad takes. Right. But he actually has a lot less of them than you'd expect. And I think some of like what people expect of him is based on shit he did a very long time ago. For example, in July of 2021, a post went viral on Facebook with the text, Jesse Ventura warned us since 2009, which is about the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's a clip from this episode of his show. Basically, it's a clip of him in his 2009 show being like, visiting a Bilderberg group meeting and being like, they're going to make a bioweapon to kill people, right? Um, so you can see how it like, like a lot of COVID people will be like, Jesse was warning us that like the elites were going to make a bioweapon. Um, and I can see how seeing that you would assume that he was just kind of involved in the anti like lockdown, anti mask shit. That is not the case. Uh, and in fact, in October of 2020, Jesse Ventura made a public statement claiming that modern America, based on his experience in the COVID-19 pandemic, he believed modern America would have lost the Second World War. Um, quote, the country, this country sacrificed in World War II. Do you think there would have been any argument over wearing a mask for the people of World War II? I'll tell you, if we behave like we are right now, Hitler would have won. He'd have won because this country won't face any type of, they don't want to sacrifice. What is wearing a mask? That is nothing to do for it to be required to do that. And yet we have half the country who won't put it on because they got egos. We got a president that won't wear one and even get sick and he still won't wear one. I'm just glad that this generation wasn't around when my mom and dad fought in World War II because we would would have lost had we had the same type of response we're having today to simple things of sacrificing a little bit for the common good. That's some real shit there. Yeah, I mean, he's not. He's not wrong. I mean, no, very, he's very right. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I mean like you, you can look back at like the the they called it what the, the Spanish flu at the beginning yeah. of the 20th century, and there were they, they were people who had a well, similar response back then. But sure, his his what he's saying is historically debatable. But um, in right, terms but, of like yeah, yeah, what it says about him as a person, I think the thing you have to conclude, really looking into it, which is not to say he's not wrong about stuff, but like he's maybe he's like up there with you know one or two other people as like the most consistently reasonable politicians with meaningful electoral success in the united mm-hmm. states um just always you know during uh during the invasion of iraq he was really consistently anti the invasion of iraq um my favorite jesse ventura moment is he goes on the view 
when the stuff about the Bush administration's torture policy comes out, he goes on The View and they're being like, well, you know, they're saying, you know, this is waterboarding. I, I, you know, maybe it does. It's not really torture necessarily. And he's like, no, look, when I was in Bud's training, we had like, you know, capture evasion resistance sort of like training. And I got waterboarded and I'll fucking tell you it's torture. Right. Um, I don't know. I think Jesse, the, the body Ventura, uh, Kind of, kind of all right guy. I, there you there's go. a quote I remember from him where like someone was snowmobiling in Minnesota and they like crashed through the ice on a mm-hmm. lake and died. Mm-hmm. And they came to Jesse Ventura, who's the governor at the time. They're like, yeah, we need to change the regulations to make like snowmobiling safer. And he said where TV cameras could see him, he's like, you can't regulate stupidity. I mean, those guys <laughs> drove out on the lake and died. I mean, what do you... Yeah, like, God damn. <laughs> like what a like what a normal guy thing to say yeah. as a politician. It is. He he <laughs> has a couple of those. That my other favorite Jesse moment is when he's governor of Minnesota, the state of Virginia. Every so often, there's this Confederate battle flag that got captured by a, a Minnesota infantry unit during the Civil War, and periodically Virginia will be like. Please give us our flag back. Um, And when they did it to Jesse, his response was, why? We won. (laughs) (laughs) Come get it, bitch. If if your response is anything other than to do the jerk off motion as hard as you possibly can. (laughs) Give us our flag back. Conquered, not stolen, motherfuckers. Uh, anyway, that's that's our very long Jesse the Body Ventura digression, and also how Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan killed the WWF Union. Uh, now I feel like this episode is full enough for you and all. Probably to be proud of. several yeah. human beings as a result. Yes, al- almost certainly, Tom. If you're including yeah. the lack of medical care as, as an act of murder, I sure am. <laughs> a non-zero body count. Um, Listen, if Hulkster didn't stop wrestlers from unionizing we would have never got no holds barred to mm-hmm. me mr nanny <laughs> suburban commando none of these things mm-hmm. uh, well okay now that you mentioned suburban commando i've come back around I- yeah. any body count is worth <laughs> having that movie uh anyway speaking of body count i got two high body count guys Right. Why don't you plug your pluggables? I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> All right. You, you are right. We have murdered scores of people. Yeah. I, you know, you could either interpret it as mu- murdered or as sex <laughs> in the way that uh, the kids today are. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's got to do it for all of us here at behind the WWF. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, having a having a good day, Tom, Sean, you got a pluggable to throw up in here? Go ahead, Tom. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I have a, a a podcasting and streaming network with my buddy Dave Bell. Both uh, both of us uh, also from Cracked, uh, like everybody here. Um, it's uh, Gameplay Unemployed. You head over to patreon.com slash Gameplay Unemployed. You can also find us wherever you listen to podcasts um, and check it out. We have a lot of cool uh, original shows and uh, you can you can uh, commission your own podcast. It's It's pretty neat. Check it out. All right. <clears throat> well, three years ago, I started 1900hotdog.com with the legendary Robert Brockway. Oh, uh, yes. And we are, it's kind of as close to Golden Age Cracked as anything I imagine. It's the last yes. comedy website. We got words Glorious. and jokes, uh, just like the good old days. Yeah, it is. It's like the comedy equivalent. Have you guys seen the second Planet of the Apes movie where like there's that society living underground worshiping nuclear weapons? Oh, sure. um, That's yeah. what we're going for. It, yeah, it's exactly it's the that of internet comedy. Um, <laughs> and you know, eventually something confusing is going to happen with Charlton Heston, and you will bring about the end of days. <laughs> um, which is why everyone needs to get to one nine hundred hot dog right now, because if you give them enough money, we can avoid the twenty twenty four election or accelerate it. <laughs> yeah, or accelerate it. One of the two. <sighs> uh, and, and that's the podcast. And mm-hmm. Robert. If people liked this episode but said, hmm, there were a lot of ads, what could they do about that? They could go to Apple Premium, and Apple Premium can figure out their fucking problems. Yeah, you you can get all episodes completely ad-free with Cooler Zone Media subscription, available exclusively on Apple Podcasts. You didn't see it, listeners, but I gave you a, a really charming smile with a big thumbs up. 
<laughs> I didn't. I okay. was scaling the whole plug. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good balance, friend. See, this this is what makes you a pro. Well, I'm this really sending out rage vibes cool to try media. to counteract More it. from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.